All right, so we are going to talk about how to configure endpoint groups. So we're gonna go over some specific steps on how you can accomplish this. So it's a four step procedure. Uh, step one, you configure something called an application profile. Uh, the next step, step two, you configure something called an application EPG. Uh, step three, you will configure something called a static port. And then step four, you map your endpoint group back to uh, what's called a physical domain. So these are the four steps. Uh, and this slide right here, uh, what I'm doing is showing you like a visual representation of the configuration you're going to be doing. So you're going to be creating an EPG. Uh, you'll do that in the first two steps. Uh, and then after that, what you do is you, in step three, is you configure a static port. So you're going to define where that EPG resides, which leaf switch, which interface, and what the VLAN ID is. And then step four, you're going to map it back to a physical domain and say, hey, we're going to use a bare metal server behind this interface. So let's talk about the first step. The first step is you uh, create something called an application profile, and, it, and it's pretty simple. All it is is really like a folder that endpoint groups can be placed in. And, and it represents like the entire application or service. So for example, you could create an application profile called Exchange Server. And then inside of that, in a later step, you could create multiple endpoint groups within that application profile. So notice here, I got uh, one EPG I created for my web servers. I have a different EPG I created for my Exchange app servers, and then a third EPG I created for my Exchange uh, database servers. Uh, and then one of the cool things you can do in ACI is you can view the application from like a network health perspective. So you could click on the application profile inside of the 8-pick GUI and view the health score and, or you could do it per EPG as well. Uh, now you might wanna, so this is one example of one application profile you can create for your Exchange server. Uh, you could create a different application profile. Maybe you're responsible for rolling out TechZone within Cisco. Uh, and again, to roll out that TechZone application, it's typically done in three tiers. So you create the application profile TechZone and then within that application profile, you create three different EPGs, one for web, one for application servers, and one for database servers. Uh, a different example of how you can use application profiles is uh, if you're using hypervisors, uh, you could create an application profile called ESXi. Now, hypervisors will usually have multiple layer three interfaces used for different th things. So, and those are called VM kernel interfaces. So you might have one VM kernel interface that's used for management access of your hypervisor. You can create one EPG for that type of traffic. You can create a second EPG for your vMotion VM kernel interface on your hypervisors. And then you could create a third EPG for your IP storage. So that could be a VM kernel interface used maybe for iSCSI. So step one is again to create an application profile. So notice here, I'm going into the lab, I'm in my tenant. So you go into your little container, uh, you right click application profiles, create an application profile, and then just name it. Now notice here, there's a little plus sign. So if you wanted to, you could click this plus sign and start to automatically create your EPGs within this window. Now, one of the things I like to do, and I do, the, I do this throughout this class on a lot of the different things we're configuring, um, is I break everything out into individual steps, which I think is important to help you know, facilitate learning. One of the things in ACI that's very easy to do when you're configuring things is sometimes you open up one window and then within that window you hit a plus sign and then that window you know, launches another window and from with that window you hit a plus sign and then the next window you hit next, next, next and then hit another plus sign. And sometimes it's like so easy to, to just be like get lost and be like, man, I completely forgot. What the heck am I configuring? So when we're going through this introductory course, 
I actually have you configure the different steps independently. So right now we're just configuring the application profile. Uh, in the next step, I'm gonna have you do a separate step to actually create uh, the EPG itself. So, so far all we created is like a glorified folder that rep represents the application. So in that last example, I created the uh, student one app profile, that's what I labeled it. So this is a screenshot from my lab. Uh, so step two is to create EPGs within that application uh, or within the application profile. So notice here I'm going, I'm selecting my application profile and then underneath that application profile, I right click it and then I create my application EPG and then bam, this window pops up. So I simply label the EPG, uh, not much to it really, uh, but notice this, I want you to look at this, sc this screenshot right here. I want you to scan the different configurations and settings within this EPG, and I want you to tell me, what is this EPG being associated to? And so the answer is it's being associated to the bridge domain, the bridge domain we previously created in our last lecture. So essentially, if we look at a visual representation of what we just did, we just created our EPG, linked it back to our bridge domain and our tenant. So a bridge domain, just to kind of remember of what that is. So that's where we can define our layer two flooding rules. You can define whether or not you want to route you can define the default gateways, uh, and it's your like your layer two domain. And that links up to our VRF, that's kind of like our routing table. So, so far, again, this is our visual representation of what we accomplished. Step one, I created the application profile. Step two, I just created one EPG. It's that student one app EPG under the app profile. Now, this is, the really the only thing we've accomplished. So in the first two steps, I created my app profile, then I created my EPG. But we got some remaining steps to complete because I need to define where that EPG resides, the leaf switch, the interface, and the VLAN ID to be used. So we got some additional steps, additional work to do, and that takes us to step three. And step three, we're gonna configure something called a static port. And when you're configuring a static port, you're defining or hard coding two things. You're defining which leaf switch and interface will be used. So in this example, it's gonna be leaf 101, interface 13. And then we're gonna define the VLAN ID that gets used to identify traffic within that EPG. So we're gonna use VLAN 10. So if traffic comes in on VLAN 10 coming into LEAF 101, LEAF 101, on, or more specifically on this interface, LEAF 101 will say, oh, this traffic needs to be placed within the application EPG. All right, so let's talk about why we need to define static ports. Uh, so we can kind of get your, maybe help you get your head wrapped around it. Obviously we need to define where the EPG is, but there's times in ACI where you do have to configure static ports and there's times when you don't have to. So let's talk about the time that you do have to. So notice here I got LEAF 101. It has an interface going to a bare metal server. And notice here we have a quote from LEAF 101. LEAF 101 saying, I have no idea where this EPG server reside and what VLAN to use. I need the admin's help. Because ACI does not integrate with this bare metal server right here. So LEAF switch 101 has no idea, you know, where this bare metal server resides and which EPG it should be placed into. Now, if you're integrating with VMware, it's different. If you're integrating with VMware, uh, it integrates with your vCenter server. And so I would like to say ACI will reach out to the hypervisor. Let's pretend this is a hypervisor instead. Uh, if you do that, what you can do is the, you configure things. For, you can, for example, configure what EPGs from the APIC. Uh, 
they'll get pushed out as pork groups uh, on the hypervisor. So if you created the app EPG uh, on the APIC, that would get pushed out as the app pork group. I'll put PG for pork group on the hypervisor. And then the APIC would dynamically assi assign out a VLAN ID from your VLAN range. So let's just say it dynamically assigns out VLAN 10. Well, the leaf switch, I think that what they use here is the leaf switch will know there's a hypervisor on the other side of the wire. I think you can either use, I think you can either use LLDP or CDP, either one of those protocols. So the leaf knows that that hypervisor is on the other side of the wire and a port group just got pushed out to it with VLAN 10. So it can go ahead and program the VLAN on this interface. So it's a pretty slick technology when you're integrating with VMware because you don't have to, to, to necessarily define static ports. But if you have a bare metal server on the other side of the wire, you're not integrating with that bare metal server. So you gotta define where that bare metal server resides. All right, so let's show you what step three looks like. So again, notice here, I'm now I'm in my EPG, I expand that out. And then I go under static ports, I right click it, uh, configure the static port, this window pops up. So I want you to look at this window. I'm con con again, I'm configuring a static port. I'm defining where the EPG resides. I want you to scan the contents of this screenshot and tell me what leaf switch and interface are we binding the EPG to? The answer is leaf 101 interface 13. So leaf 101 interface 13. Now I have another question for you about this screenshot. What about the VLAN ID? What is the VLAN ID we are using to identify traffic within the EPG on that port? VLAN ID is 10. And then my last question for you is again, referencing the screenshot, is the, tra is the traffic tagged or untagged on the wire? when it's coming in or leaving port 13 for this EPG? The answer is it is an access port. So it is untagged. So this little config right here, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this right now. Uh, this is how you can tag or untag traffic on the wire. So I'll kind of go back and forth to this next slide just to kind of give you a visual. Uh, but what I'm doing here is and if I'm selecting access, I'm essentially doing this. You can think of us configuring the port as like switch port mode access, and your access VLAN would be 10. So that means if you're not tagging the traffic. So if the server sends traffic with no VLAN ID, it's gonna come into the in interface and be accepted as VLAN 10 because it's an access port. So that's what you, you would typically configure, go, configure going down to bare metal servers. Uh, if you were to select trunk, um, then what you're essentially doing is you're configuring the interface as a trunk port. So guess what? If you configure it as a trunk port, uh, what you're doing is tagging VLAN 10. So it's like switch port mode trunk. And because it's a trunk port, guess what? You can configure multiple static ports across different EPGs if you wanted to. So I could have, this is one static port I'm creating. I could create another static port for interface 1.3 on uh, leaf 101, and I could tag it with a different VLAN ID for a different EPG if I wanted to. Now for an access port, it's a little different. You can only create one static port for that specific interface if you're gonna configure it as an access port. You can't configure an access port multiple times. I wouldn't configure this interface, switch port mode access, switch port access VLAN 10, and then later configure it with switch port access VLAN 11. You couldn't do two access VLANs. So if you select at mode access, you can only configure one static port. The traffic is untagged. If you configure mode trunk, the, tra the VLAN ID is gonna be tagged, and then you could configure some other static ports with, if you wanted to with different VLAN IDs. The third option is access 8021.p. Uh, this is configuring it to be trunk uh, 
but what you're doing is you're making it native. So this would be like doing switch port mode trunk, and then the next command would be switch port trunk native VLAN 10. So this is how, when you're doing a static port, this is where you can define whether to leave it as an access port, make it a trunk port, or make this VLAN, the native VLAN on a trunk port. All right, so essentially what we've done is we, you know, previously created our EPG in the, pre the first two steps, and then we defined where that EPG is going to reside and which VLAN ID we're going to use. And again, this is gonna be an access VLAN, so traffic would come in untagged from the bare metal server ingressing it into interface 1.3. All right, so we talked about the first three steps. The, the fourth step sometimes takes a little while, I think, to get your head wrapped around why we're doing it. But step four, an EPG must be associated back to a domain. Now, what are we trying to accomplish here? What are we trying to do in step four is first of all, we're defining the type of device behind the interface using that EPG, so it's a bare metal server. And then the second, I would say more important thing is we're validating our config. So essentially what we're doing is a validating this config right here within our tenant. We just created a static port under our EPG that said we, we wanted to use inter Leaf 101 Interface 13 VLAN 10. We're mapping this back to a domain to validate it against our access policies. So we talked about access policies earlier. So essentially what you're doing is within your EPG, you're mapping it back to your chain of access policies and you're mapping it back to the domain. So the domain is like the connector. It's like the meeting point. Uh, it connects your tenant config or your EPG config back to your access policies. And what we wanna make sure, and there'll be more on this later, we'll talk about this in a lot more depth in our, I think our next lecture. Really what we wanna do is make sure what you configure here matches against your access policies. So if you look at this chain of access policies, they said VLAN 10 through 15 will be used for bare metal servers. They can use interface 1.3, LEAF 101. And so we'll talk more about this kind of validation procedure a little bit later on and how you can troubleshoot this. Uh, so, so this is showing you example of step four. So again, I'm in my EPG, I go to domains. Uh, I'm going to select the physical domain because that's the type of domain you should have configured in your access policies earlier if you wanna set up communication going to a bare metal server. So I select the correct domain and then I map back to the domain. So what actually should happen now is after you set up your EPG, all these things we've been talking about earlier throughout this class should finally get pushed out to Leaf Switch 101. Cause we said, hey, we wanna use this EPG on Leaf 101 Interface 1.3. So all those things we configured in our tenant earlier. So maybe we configured a default gateway Maybe we configured a bridge domain. Maybe we configured a VRF. That, all that configuration is finally gonna get pushed out to LEAF 101. So notice here, none of it, oh, this is before. So let me take a step back. This is before we did that EPG config. In this lecture, we took your EPG, we created it, we mapped it back to your bridge domain, and that bridge domain is mapped back to the VRF. So since we did all this work in this lecture, now all this configuration is gonna be deployed out to LEAF 101. And the one example we're looking at here is I'm looking at the VRFs that were created on LEAF 101. Look at here, we now have the student one VRF. We also should have any default gateways that are configured under your bridge domain should get pushed out to LEAF 101, assuming unicast routing is enabled on the bridge domain. Uh, so let's go back and look at the before. So again, the before did not have the student one VRF. And if you were to look at another switch, 
So if you were to run, if you were, instead of running Fabric 101, if you ran Fabric 104, if there's like Leaf Switch 104, you wouldn't see that VRF get pushed out. That VRF is not needed on Leaf 104. We haven't defined an EPG yet and a static port over there to use an interface on Leaf 104. So it's actually a good thing. You know, configurations only will get pushed out to switches if it's actually needed. And that's a good thing, right? We push out only configuration and resources that will get used within the network. So finally, once you do these steps, finally you can start pinging things. You know, you know so for example, if you set up an SVI uh, or a gateway under your bridge domain, your bare metal server should be able to ping that gateway, assuming it's on the same subnet. Now, to communicate outside of its EPG, that's a little bit different. Right now, this bare metal server is in the app EPG. If it wanted to ping a device on the database EPG uh, or some external EPG, we would have some additional work to do, and we'll talk more about that later. For now, that's all we have.